Intimate Judaism deals with sensitive topics and uses explicit language. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to Intimate Judaism. This is Tali Rosenbaum. And I'm Rabbi Scott Kahn. We're very excited today to do our very special episode on answering questions from our listeners. And we have had so many, and unfortunately, we're not going to be able to get to all of them, but we've handpicked a few that we are hoping will be of interest to everybody. When we told people we're doing this episode, we were inundated with questions. So as you said, unfortunately, we're not going to nearly get to everything, but we will do what we can. And after this, we're going to have a follow-up episode, a Q&A for some of the questions we didn't get to, exclusively for Patreon subscribers. Then we'll be able to tackle some of the issues we didn't get to today. Patreon supporters get bonus materials, merch, and this Q&A coming up, as well as more in the future. It's a great opportunity, if you've benefited from Intimate Judaism, to support the work that Tali and I do. The link is in the description of this podcast, as well as in the show notes. We thank you in advance, and we hope you enjoy the bonus material that's there. We would also very much like to welcome our new volunteer intern to our staff at Intimate Judaism. Her name is Liat Sternfeld, and she is a recent graduate of the University of Michigan. She has been helping us a lot with our social media and getting the word out there. So thank you, Liat, for joining our Intimate Judaism team. Yes, thank you, Liat. Make sure to visit our website, intimatejudaism.com, for the full podcast archive, show notes, a free men's mikvah list, and more. Please continue to send us your questions and comments to intimatejudaism at jewishcoffeehouse.com. Also, make sure to visit jewishcoffeehouse.com and tallyrosenbaum.com. One last announcement, Tally, before we get to the episode itself. A lot of people contact me to talk about starting their own podcast, so I'm pleased to announce that this Wednesday, February 17th at 1 p.m. Eastern Time, or 8 p.m. Israel Time, I will be giving a free one-hour Zoom class on how to start your own podcast. If you would like to join, write to me at scott at jewishcoffeehouse.com, and I'll send you a Zoom link. Even if you can't make the class, you can still write to me, and I'll send you a link to the recording. And in general, if you're interested in producing your own podcast, just go to jewishcoffeehouse.com, where you can learn about how to do it. All right, Tali, I'll start off by reading the first question. I am a male and enjoy anal stimulation. My wife thinks this is abnormal behavior and a fetish usually associated with homosexual activity. I also like to anally stimulate my wife, but she has an aversion and says that it is an exit and not an entrance. I asked these questions because in a previous episode, you mentioned that vaginal intercourse is called kidarka, which means the regular way, and anal intercourse is called lokidarka, which means the abnormal way, and is permissible. How should I discuss this with my wife? I know all sexual behavior must be consensual, and I cannot force myself on my wife. What about the fact that I enjoy being on the receiving end? For a heterosexual male, is the pleasure of anal stimulation a normal kink? Okay, I'm happy to look at this question. I think that there are several different questions in this question. What I'm picking up on is kind of a desire to know if it is normal, quote unquote, whatever that means, or if it's a kink to enjoy anything having to do with anal play. One person's kink is another person's normal, meaning that, yes, it's considered normative if you enjoy anal stimulation. The anus is just another area of the body that has erotic zones in it. And wherever you enjoy touch on your body, you're going to want to be touched on your body. That said, um, if your wife doesn't enjoy having anything near her anus or inserted in her anus, then obviously we can really only practically relate to the question of having you receive the anal stimulation that you would like to have. There is a question in here about whether it's, again, quote unquote normal if you're a heterosexual male. And of course, I think some men do wonder that if they do enjoy anal play, that maybe they are gay. So first of all, no, there's no indication that you have to be gay to want anal pleasure. There's a very good book that a lot of sex therapists always talk about by a sexologist named Jack Morin, and it's a book about anal pleasures, all about anal play. You know, everything kind of comes back to communication when it comes to couples. And if you were to let your wife know what you enjoy There are ways that she could stimulate you near the anus, and if she's averse to putting her finger there, near there, or or inside, there are also certain sex toys like anal plugs or beads 
that you could learn how to play with. You know, if she's not interested in receiving anal intercourse from you, then there might not be an opportunity for you to do that. But certainly she would likely be open to pleasuring you if there's a way that she could do that without going beyond her boundaries. In fact, I think that in general, when it comes to what if I want to do something and my wife doesn't want to do something or vice versa, I think this is more of a general question about like, how much can I push? And I think that in general, we can't push. We can't go beyond or threaten or demand. Obviously, all sexual activity should be mutual and consensual. But I also think that when couples have an intention to want to please each other, they may wish to go out of their comfort zone a little bit in order to help the other one out or do what the other person would want. The way I look at it is kind of like there are the green go zones and then there are the yellow, like it's not in my comfort zone, but I'm willing to give it a try zones. And then there are those red zones that there's no way I'm going to be able to do that. And I think that we see these disparities a lot in sex therapy. Um, Sometimes even the I want to do kink. I want to do BDSM. I think that we in our communities don't have a very good understanding of these different sexual practices. And I think we should look forward to doing an entire episode on kink and BDSM. But back to your question about whether anal stimulation is even in the category of kink. There's some controversy about that. I think that many believe that it's not. Some say it is. What difference does it make? Right. I just have a quick comment about something which isn't even so relevant to the question, but it's something that he said. He talks about Kedarka and Shalokedarka. Kedarka in halachic literature refers to vaginal intercourse, and Shalokedarka refers to anal intercourse. And the first point is regarding what the questioner is talking about. This is not really relevant to his question about his stimulation, because that's speaking about the man having anal intercourse right. with his wife. In terms of right. the woman stimulating the man on his anus, there's no halachic issue with that. So let that be set aside. The other point I want to make that's not so relevant to this, but it should be clarified when he says that he heard me say that vaginal intercourse and anal intercourse are both permissible. That's true. And people should listen to episodes eight and 16 to get more details about that. Nevertheless, that is an oversimplification. I don't want people to misunderstand what we said. There are many opinions about this. There are those who come from the school of the Ravid and the Beit Yosef, and some of them are mystical schools, which do not agree that anal intercourse is permitted. Those like the Rama say that anal intercourse is permitted as long as it's done not all the time, as long as it's an occasional form of intercourse rather than the main form of intercourse that they do. And there are some who say that not only anal intercourse is allowed, but other things called derech evarim, which means oral intercourse, or basically any other non-vaginal and non-anal ejaculation is also permitted. And even mentioning these various opinions is also itself a big oversimplification because there are many contexts and caveats that also need to be taken into account. But largely the point is that, yes, it's true, they're both permissible, However, there are caveats such as it shouldn't be done all the time, and there are many different opinions and some who say that it's not permissible. Again, listen to episodes 8 and 16. Yeah, I think that one thing about this podcast, which is, I think, so unique, is that when was the last time anyone had a conversation about anal sex that you know about in your community or with your friends? There are topics that are so taboo. When the questioner says that his wife thinks it's abnormal and it's a fetish and it's an exit and not an entrance. I think that that's very um, reasonable to feel that way. Many people do feel that way, but there are also many people that feel that it's an erotic zone and when it's cleaned um, sufficiently and you use a lubricant and there are ways to actually, for people who do like that kind of thing, to totally legitimize it and to even encourage couples to look for what each other would want in order to enhance their intimate lives together. Good. Why don't you read the next question, Tali? Sure. My wife is seven months pregnant, and due to complications, we are not able to have vaginal intercourse. Are we able to do other forms like manual manipulation, even if it comes to ejaculation? What about masturbation? I think that's a, your question for you. <laughs> yes. Once again, episodes 8 and 16 are your primary resource, and you should also look at the show notes there because we bring down a lot of the sources as well. However, the basic question here about medical complications or other emotional complications, perhaps, which don't allow a couple to have vaginal intercourse, are they allowed to have other forms of intercourse, non-vaginal intercourse? The basic answer in this case 
is yes. As I always say, there are different opinions. I'm giving you my opinion about this. You may have your own halachic decisors to talk to. I want to quote what Rav David Stav and Rav Avraham Stav wrote in a book they have called Avobe Techa. I don't know if it's available in English. I believe it is being translated, but I'm not sure. In the first volume, they have a chapter talking about these issues. It's a long chapter. There's a lot to be discussed. At the end, there's a summary. I'm going to read summary point number four and translate as I go along. When there is a guideline for therapeutic reasons and temporarily that a couple should have intercourse, derech evarim, again, that means non-vaginally, non-anally. And for the record, non-anal sex is usually considered a more serious problem, should there be any problem whatsoever, than anal sex. So when people talk about vaginal sex, anal sex, and then derech evarim, just if people are wondering why those two are separate, it's because halachically, anal sex is considered a form of sex for certain halachic purposes. However, derech evarim, for example, oral sex or a hand job are not considered sex at all. It's just effectively non-vaginal ejaculation. That's why in some contexts that is considered by some to be a more serious violation should there be a violation. Okay, I just want to explain in terms of within a marriage. Again, as we mentioned, in this case, it's not a violation, but that's why saying derech evarim, you could say all the more so they're allowed to do it anally too. Okay, as I go on, if there is a therapeutic reason to have sex derech evarim, or if the woman is not sure she's ready for regular vaginal sex, and she wants to, so to speak, practice to get used to it, it is mutar la asokain. It is allowed to do so. I'm going to add a caveat, which I don't think you're going to like, Tali, but I have to read Rafstav as he writes it. It is also better, if the woman is capable of this, for the husband to ejaculate near her vagina. The reason Rafstav says that is because there are some opinions which say that even if a couple doesn't have vaginal intercourse, if the ejaculate is near the vagina, then effectively it's kind of like vaginal intercourse and therefore you can avoid the halachic problem should there be a halachic problem. However, as he says, that's only if a woman is capable of this. And as we mentioned earlier in other episodes, others would say that's not a necessary caveat, particularly in this case where there is a therapeutic reason, obviously, whether it's emotional or physical, I would say that it's mutar. It's allowed. I think what I would add here, though, just kind of looking deeper into the dynamic between the couple is that, again, communicate, communicate, communicate. If your wife is happy to allow you to ejaculate near her because it is so important for her as well as for you to have a you know lesser prohibition in the list of what's worse and what's better, then obviously that's the way you should go. But then there's also a deeper and more complex level that we have to be very aware of. For many women, is the possibility that they're going to feel that their body is being needed or used in order to satisfy a religious need, which is actually not a religious need, it's based on personal need in a better kind of religious way, that can have an impact and it can have a negative impact. And so we often have to figure out how to juggle the potential negative impact, which is also a mental health concern, from the letter of the law sometimes. And sometimes if your wife is, you know, think about it, let's say you're a high risk pregnancy and you're afraid to have sex, you might even be afraid to have an orgasm. You know, you're afraid of having any kind of contractions and you don't want to do anything because, you know, let's say you were in fertility treatments and it took you a really, really long time to get pregnant. You want to cuddle and you want to be together, but you're afraid to get aroused. You're just afraid to get into it. And then your husband comes and says, look, I just need to ejaculate on you or near you. You're just not there. Um, sometimes it might be better to masturbate. Maybe having a discussion or having an intimate kind of communication can lead to a way in which you don't have to, but sometimes you may have to. And I think being able to forgive yourself for making a choice and choosing mental health sometimes over halacha. Maybe it's not even choosing it over halacha. Maybe somebody would say if that's the situation, it might actually be a mitzvah to take care of yourself. Tali, it's interesting you say that because that relates directly to another question. I'll read it right now. My question is about Nida, how to handle when one partner has sexual desires during Nida or the Shiva Nikiim, that means during the time that a husband and wife are prohibited to each other because she got her period. Should masturbation be acceptable or encouraged? How to physically or mentally handle it individually and in the context of a relationship? I'll first say that the answer, in my opinion, is no. It is not allowed during Nida, or during the Shiva Nikim, for the husband to masturbate. And I don't think there can be much debate about that according to halacha. Let me explain because what I'm... It's never allowed, because it's never allowed well, to masturbate. Well, yes, yes and no, Tali. I agree with you. Yes, you're never allowed to masturbate. Okay. However, we have said that, for example, in the context of a couple 
cuddling in the context of what's called chibuk v'nishuk, hugging and kissing, or even if they just want to have sex, derech evarim, which is kind of a form of masturbating. She's pleasuring him or they're pleasuring each other. That, we said, in many contexts is allowed. In this situation, though, I'm saying it's not allowed. I'd even go further, though. We had, I think it was our very first episode, and it was when we originally started recording, and we talked about masturbation. I've never received so much feedback as I have about that particular topic, because immediately, many people who were involved in yeshivot, teaching young men Torah, wanted to talk to me about how they're supposed to present this particular issue, because it is such a big issue, and I can say with certainty that the way it's taught in many, if not most, institutions of Torah learning is not right. It's not working. It can be difficult from a mental health perspective. There are all sorts of problems. And as I mentioned in that episode, I myself have had problems when I was a teacher teaching like that. And in retrospect, knowing what I know now, I would do it very differently. One of the ways that we can look at masturbating for young men, and this is not saying it's mutar because it's still a sore, it's still prohibited. But one of the important points there is that the Gemara talking about masturbating, talking about hotzat zera levatala, spilling seed in vain, the Gemara in general is actually talking largely to married men. We already know the Gemara is not usually speaking to women. It's also not speaking to teenagers of the 21st century. It was speaking to people who were already married because at that time they used to get married 1820, and that's also the age you're supposed to learn Gemara, which means it's largely speaking to married men. Does that mean it's mutar for younger men? I'm not saying that. It's not. But we have to take away the sting of the violation from younger men. And again, listen to that episode for more details. In some ways, Tali, I would say if there's anyone the Gemara was talking to, it's the person asked about in the question. It's talking about a married man who has his wife, they have a regular sexual relationship, and during Nida, during the Shiva Nikim, they refrain. They don't touch each other. And the question is, can he be Motsi Shikh Vatar Vatala? Can he masturbate during that time? If there's any time the Gemara was talking to anybody, I think it was then, more than any other time. In fact, I was talking to one of my teachers about this very issue, and he said that it might be that when Chazal prohibited spilling seed in vain, it's because it's reserved for your wife. It's a selfish thing. It's having sex by yourself when it's supposed to be mutual enjoyment for two people. It's something that they're supposed to do together. By his saying that, he was saying maybe that takes away, again, the sting from singles. It wasn't really talking about them, while not saying it's permitted, but it wasn't really talking about them. It's much more talking to a married couple. To me, this is in some ways one of the main cases that the Gemara was almost certainly talking about. We can't get out of it by trying to find a way. I just want to make one more point about this, because I think it actually relates to what you said before about what would Halacha say in this case, and directly how you said, maybe you break Halacha or maybe Halacha would allow it. And to me, that's actually a very important point. I'm going to tell a very quick story, 30 seconds. There's a book by Rabbi Herbert Wiener, who was a reform rabbi, called Nine and a Half Mystics. I highly recommend it. He went around the United States and Israel talking to different mystical authorities, some religious, some not religious, all Jewish. And he had numerous meetings with the Lubavitcher Rebbe. And my favorite scene in the entire book was they had a like 3 a.m. discussion. The Lubavitcher Rebbe had read some of Rabbi Wiener's writings, and he was writing from a reform Judaism perspective. And the Lubavitcher Rebbe said, people think that the difference between us, meaning orthodoxy or Lubavitch, and reform or non-orthodox streams of Judaism is that you compromise and we don't compromise. That's not true, said the Lubavitcher Rebbe. We both compromise. The difference is that we don't sanctify the compromise. And I always thought that was a very, very interesting idea and it relates directly to how I understand halacha. What he means is, as I understand it, if someone says, look, I want to keep Shabbat, but I'm not ready to not drive on Shabbat. So according to this perspective, you can say, okay, that's all right. You know something? We'll try something else, and maybe we'll revisit it in six months. We'll see then if maybe you'll be ready. That's very different than saying, okay, you know what? You're not ready to not drive on Shabbat. You're allowed to drive on Shabbat. That's a different thing altogether. So my perspective, and I've said this many times, both on this podcast and even more so in individual talks with people, I think that we can say to people, you know something? Halacha says X, Y, or Z. Now, if you're not ready for that, that's between you and God. I'm not going to tell you you have to keep halacha but I don't want to go and violate halacha's norms by pretending halacha says something that it doesn't. I don't mean to be dismissive. I don't mean that at all. If someone, a couple, let's say, feels they can't keep a certain halacha, that is genuinely not my place to tell them whether they're right or wrong. That's between the couple and God and their relationship with each other and the relationship with Hashem. I don't go in there. That's not for anyone to talk about except for them. That's their decision. And maybe it's the right decision for them, not for me to say. But we can't pretend halacha says something that it doesn't say by saying, okay, you want to do something? Rather than say we're going to sanctify the compromise by saying halacha says it's okay, we can say, okay, maybe in this case you're not going to keep halacha. 
that's up to you to decide. But I don't want to pretend halacha says something it doesn't say, that it does not say. And in this case, I think halacha is pretty clear. So when I um, look at questions, I try to understand a little bit what is screaming out from the question, you know, how to physically, mentally handle it. I think that we have to acknowledge that for many couples, the Nida period is very, very challenging. And I don't think it's about masturbation or not masturbation. I think that the cutting off of any sort of physical intimacy is what makes people feel lonely and abandoned. It's not as common that a woman would say, oh my gosh, like I can't stand not having an orgasm for two weeks and, you know, I have to I have to have a release. But that's what you're hearing from this question. And the reason is, is because very often men kind of sexualize their feelings of loneliness and abandonment. So he's saying, you know, can I just masturbate to, to take care of myself? But there are really feelings here. So the answer is not, you know, yes, you can masturbate or no, you can't masturbate. It's how about if you and your wife sit and really talk about how it feels to not be able to touch each other. And when you have a way to express yourself emotionally, then you're less likely to need the sexualizing act of soothing yourself through masturbation. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. I think you're saying a very important caveat to what I said, that beyond the question itself, there's another point which has to be addressed too, which you're doing right now. Do you want to read the next question? Okay, here's a good question. Why do we encourage couples to just get the first time over with? If there were less pressure to go into Nida right away and couples were encouraged to take their time getting familiar with one another, wouldn't that encourage healthier communication and sex lives in the long run? So let me answer the first part of that question. Why is there an emphasis to have sex on the wedding night? There are a few different reasons, and I'll mention three of them right offhand. The first one is that People will say it's a mitzvah. There's a special mitzvah to have sex the night of the wedding, to have it right away. And zrizi makdimim le mitzvot. Yes. The zealous do the mitzvah as fast as they can. Another reason is that there's a fear that if they don't, the husband will ejaculate non-vaginally. And third of all, if the couple goes into nida before they have sexual intercourse or vaginal intercourse, there are potential halachic problems with the couple staying in yichud together. That means that, theoretically, should a husband and wife not have sex, and then the wife goes into nida before they had a chance to have intercourse, they can't be together by themselves until she goes to the mikvah. Now, there are answers to all these questions, and I would certainly say, based on so many people talking to me and what I've read, that we have to de-emphasize all these reasons. We have to try to remember that Couples should not be pushed to do it the first night if they're not ready. If they want to, that's great. But if they're not ready, they should understand they're allowed to take their time and there are strong reasons halachically and psychologically why that might be a good idea. And there are answers to all of these questions, for example, ejaculating non-vaginally, but in the context of foreplay is not a halachic problem. I'm sorry, it's not, at least as I see it. And in terms of the issue with Yichud, there are many answers that should that problem come up, and it is a problem. I'm not, I'm not going to pretend that that's not a halachic issue, but there are many poskim who deal with it and have found ways to allow a couple to stay together. A couple should speak to a halachic authority to find out whether that applies in their particular case, but there are answers to this, and I think that there's so much pressure on the wedding night to have sex right away. I'm sure that it's a problem for many people, and just from teaching Chatanim, I know that many of them are worried about that. They say their future wives are worried about that, and I think we have to try and tell them you can slow down a little bit. Despite the fact that these are halachic reasons that exist in the world, maybe they should be de-emphasized in favor of other halachic opinions, which are much more lenient in this matter. So I would even go further. I mean, I appreciate the way that you answered the question, and I think that there is a change that is taking place. I just don't think it's enough. And I just don't think that we speak enough to young brides and grooms and at all in the whole area of teaching healthy sexuality. We don't talk enough about consent. We don't talk enough about being ready. And we talk too much about succeeding. And Definitely I think true. that we have to really realize the impact across the spectrum of Judaism, because if you have enough sense of self to be able to say, no, 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 I'm not ready, let's take another night or another night, or let's get there slowly, then great, you can protect yourself. But in certain societies, women don't have that privilege. They are not afforded that privilege. And not only that, the men are told, even if she's nervous, or even if she's 
crying or even if it hurts her, you have to get the mitzvah done. You have to go ahead and do it. This is societal rape. It is happening. It's been happening and it continues to happen. And you know what? I can't be quiet about it any longer because when we tell people that they have to do it on the first night, but okay, but you should really get it by the second night because there are a lot of halachic problems. If you don't have sex, then we are taking away the safety of both partners, by the way. It's not just the woman. You're making the man be a perpetrator. This is really scary. These young women, they're 18, 19. They barely even know what's going to happen. And I'm seeing these women and these are traumas. And so I do think that everything little by little starts to change. And there are even Kala teachers who are beginning to talk about consent and to beginning to talk about being ready and how it's not just something you have to get over with. Now, the good news is that sometimes they're having a great time and they want to keep going and they do manage to get there right away. I mean, people are naturally inclined towards sex sometimes. There are people who are very excited about it and they're ready, but many, many young couples are not. I also think that there shouldn't be so many rabbis in the bedroom and questions. I mean, the typical scenario is we had sex. We don't know if it got in. We had to call the rabbi to see if we're in need. There's so much intervention and there's so much invasiveness of others. Okay. Mm -hmm. Couples should get married. They should have information available to them. If you need anything at all, you can ask questions, but this is yours take your time. It doesn't happen right away, especially if they've been Shomer and they haven't done anything together. It's going to take time. And the buildup is part of the excitement. And take your time. Don't rush. And halavai, there should be a change in this. And I'm sorry to keep rambling. No, I'm really glad you said that. I think it's so important. And in fact, I'm writing a madrich for Katanim, a guide for new husbands, or specifically for people who are about to be new husbands, who are going to get married, in Hilchot Nida, the laws of family purity, the term you don't particularly like. And in this guide, after having my wife read it over and having other people look at it, the main thing which I've had to add over and over, I think it's the only thing that's bold-faced in the entire guide, is that having intercourse with your wife without her full consent is rape. And people have to understand that. And that applies as much on the first night as it does any other time. The more we emphasize that, the better it is, because this is something which people simply don't internalize, that this cannot be done. And we have to be so careful about it. And rape is rape. That's a very scary word, but that's what we're talking about over here. So I'm really glad that you said that, because it's a very, very important point to make in this context. Should we go on to the next question? Sure. On that note. I question the assertion that Hirhure Arayot, sexual fantasy not in the context of actual sex with a partner, is not usur, is not prohibited for women. I know that there are differing opinions regarding the halachic permissibility of female masturbation. Example given, Rabbi Yehoshua Kaganoff and most other post-scheme hold it is permissible versus Rabbi Eliezer Malamud, who holds that it is prohibited. I also know that there are different opinions regarding whether or not histaklus applies to women. Just to clarify, that term means looking at something sexual. Example given, Rabbi Vadi Yosef says it is permitted um, versus Rabbi Shmuel Vosner, who says it is prohibited. Wow, this is a very uh, scholarly question. No question. However, from my understanding, there is no controversy, machloket, about women and hear hooray a riot. Everyone agrees that it is prohibited. Am I incorrect? Are there some post scheme who hold that hear hooray a riot is mutter for women? This is about fantasy. Is a woman allowed to fantasize? And this letter is basically saying it appears that across the board, rabbis do not allow women to fantasize. That's the question being asked. And this is relating directly to episode 28 when we had Rabbanit Oriyamovarach as our guest, and she had said that sexual fantasy for women is permitted. So I reached out to her because she really is the person who knows far more than I do about this particular topic, and I asked her, could you please give me the sources? And I simply quoted the question to her. So first of all, thank you to Rabbanit Mavarach, who was very helpful. She spent a long time explaining the details with me. 
very briefly, I don't want to go too into this, I don't want to get too into a, a discussion of the halachic sources, but effectively there are two sources for the prohibition of sexual fantasy. One of them is the pasuk, nishmarta mikol devara, you should protect yourself from all evil things. That's specifically relating to male ejaculation. That's not relevant for women. The other pasuk is from Kriyat Shema, the third paragraph, velo taturu you should not stray after your hearts and after your eyes. And Chazal tell us that after your eyes refers to sexual fantasy, both looking, she mentioned looking, as well as thinking. The question is, does this pasuk apply to women as well as to men? So there actually are three possible answers, and they're all cited by certain people. The answer is yes, no, and maybe. Among those who say this pasuk does apply to women are the Sefer Achinuch. They say, yes, women have a prohibition of fantasizing sexually. Among those who say women do not have a prohibition of fantasizing sexually, this pasuk does not apply to them, are people like the Chida and Rav Vadi Yosef. And the Rambam and the Beit Yosef, or the Shulchan Aruch, don't say anything, which leads some to believe that perhaps they didn't say it's asur, they don't say it's prohibited, so presumably it's allowed, although some people disagree with that. So the answers are yes, no, and maybe. Now, along with that, there's one more thing to say, which is that even among those who prohibit female sexual fantasy, who say this pasuk applies to women, there are two opinions about what that means. How do you define female sexual fantasy? One side says it means fantasizing in order to do something prohibited. In other words, not just thinking about it in your mind with no attempt to actually put it into practice. It means to think about it in order to practice it. Others say it applies even to fantasy with, with no attempt to put it into practice. Among those who say that, yes, this pasuk does apply to women, but it only refers to planning to do a prohibition, a Rishonim like the Smak and a Rabbeinu Yona, and Rav Moshe Feinstein also cites them. What this means in practice is that even among those who say that the prohibition does apply to women, there are those who say, but not sexual fantasy per se, only sexual fantasy with an attempt to actually put it into practice. So ultimately, just summarizing... Is sexual fantasy prohibited for women? The questioner thinks that everyone agrees that it's prohibited. Rabbanit Mavorach made it very clear there are many opinions which say that it is allowed, although some say it is not. But there certainly are opinions which say that it is allowed. And if somebody wants to hold by that opinion, as we say in halachic discourse, yesh almi lismoch, there is an opinion or there are multiple opinions upon whom one can rely. And incidentally, just one last point. Because the pasuk of Lotatu refers both to looking and to sexual fantasy per se, I asked Rabbi Mavorach if this applies to both. Those who are allowing it are talking both about looking and about fantasizing, and she confirmed that yes, that's true. Those who allow it mean both sexual fantasy and looking at things which are sexual in nature. So I'm glad that you differentiated between Hirhure Averot, the thinking about these sexual sins, and fantasy, that they may actually be different, and that here Hurea Ve wrote, mm-hmm. thinking about doing prohibited acts or even possibly planning prohibited acts is very different than sexual fantasy. And I, I just want to talk about fantasy for a moment because I think it's really important to understand what fantasy really is. Fantasy is in the realm of imagination. It's about something that we wouldn't do. It's about something that we use our minds to think about. It's about creativity. It's about passion. It's about desire. And without fantasy, when you get the message that you're not allowed to fantasize, it really has the danger of kind of closing off this part and creating an inhibition to your sexual creativity and passion. I think we have to understand that fantasy has a role. When you can fantasize about something, it can calm you down. It can help not act out doing something if you can fantasize about doing something. And the thing about fantasy is that it can also enhance your marriage because you can even use your fantasies, share them with your partner, and act them out as part of sexual play. Um, I think it's really important to keep in mind that the most important sexual organ is the brain. It's the mind. It's creativity. It's really the ability to think about your sexuality. In terms of female fantasy, in the context of marriage, I don't think that was what anyone was really talking about, at least as I understand it. In the context of having sex with your husband? In the context of having sex with your husband, I don't think that was what was being questioned. I think we're talking about... That wasn't... Yeah, that wasn't... Certainly, Rabbi Nima Vorach, in her talk with us, she was largely talking about single women fantasizing, learning about arousal by themselves without any partner on the horizon. Ah, So in that sense, I don't really... 
imagine that anyone would prohibit sexual fantasy in the context of marriage, in the context of a sexual relationship. Admittedly, there are some limits. Just as an example, a couple's not supposed to think about other people. They're supposed to think about each other. But leaving that aside, within the context of marriage, that's not what I think we're talking about. I think what we're discussing here is having sexual fantasies not in the context of a married sexual relationship. We know that the more you try to control those thoughts, the more difficult it's going to be. So for healthy sexuality, you need to have kind of a good balance between some permission for things that are harmless and also being able to regulate yourself in an appropriate way. Absolutely. Let's move on to the next question. My partner and I are both observant. He is in his late 50s, and due to his diabetes, type 2, and Legionnaire's disease, he's unable to sustain an erection. We are just starting out our relationship, and he insists that if he and I can't have a real sexual relationship, then we need to break up. I also want us to have a sexual relationship and have even offered to go with him to a urologist to see what can be done about the situation. I think that there are non-invasive techniques available to help us. However, even if nothing helps, I think there are many things we can do without having actual intercourse, which would be satisfying for both of us. He doesn't think it's okay to just have an orgasm on his own because it's against halacha. I'm assuming he means in their future marriage. What solutions can you offer us? Okay, so... There's a lot here that comes up in this question. There are a lot of topics in general that are that come up from here, which has to do with um, sexuality in midlife and later, and how sexuality can change in couples over time, and also new couples, people who are on their parak bet, you know, their second marriage in their 50s or 60s, and how to deal with sexual issues that might be present in that age group. What I'm looking at here is how she describes her partner, that he insists that if they can't have a sexual relationship, they need to break up. But he also has some very rigid ideas of what's okay and what's not okay. So, you know, a lot of his own issues with himself and with the relationship might have to do with his own ambivalence about it or anxiety about it. He certainly doesn't seem as open as she is to trying to solve these issues. He seems a lot more rigid. That's just something that I would notice. Now, any man in his 50s or late 50s, even with diabetes and especially with diabetes and other issues, um, is likely to have some decrease in sexual function Mm -hmm. from the time he was in his 20s. And it is important to take care of that, not only because even if you're not sexually active, not being able to sustain erection can really indicate other medical issues. So this man clearly already does have medical issues, but if you're a healthy male in your, let's say, 40s or 50s, and you're having sudden erectile dysfunction, there might be some other kind of issue going on in your blood flow or, or, or heart health. And so it is important to look at that in any event. But there's also the idea here that she's right on the ball when she talks about how there are other ways that you can enjoy sex in your later years. It doesn't have to be about function. There's this, uh, you've heard about the good enough mother. That's kind of a psychological approach to mothering, which means that you don't have to be a perfect mother. Well, these two guys, Metz and McCarthy, coined a phrase, the good enough sex model. And what they talk about in the good enough sex model is that sex doesn't have to be about performance. It doesn't have to be about sustaining erections or having orgasms necessarily. That sex in the later years can be very much about pleasure, pleasure and intimacy and uh, learning many different ways to be together. And we actually have in our book, um, I Am For My Beloved, that I wrote together with my colleague, David Ribner, we actually have one of these case vignettes about an older couple who are remarried and she has some vaginal pain issues from dryness postmenopausally and he has some erection issues and how they were able to navigate it. So certainly when the will is there, it's absolutely not a reason to break up, but he might have some identity issues. In other words, I'm not man enough. You don't want me if I don't have an erection, and so we might as well break up. You know, this is the kind of couple that I would want to see in my office to kind of flesh it out a little more and see what's really going on here. And in terms of the halakhic issues, I don't think I need to rehash them. I've already stated them in answers to other questions. 
Again, episodes 8 and 16, please listen to them. There are plenty of other things which are mutar apart from vaginal intercourse, particularly when vaginal intercourse is difficult or impossible. Okay, Tali, why don't you read the next question? I would like to hear about how to best relate to young adults from religious families who are no longer religious, or maybe still are, and are going to be or already are sexually active. There is an open and honest relationship, but this is an uncomfortable topic to speak about. As a parent, it can be difficult and disappointing to think about, more so than other areas of non-observance. Problems arise when the partners visit and expectations about who sleeps where arise. This is a really tough question. It's a really good question. And I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all answer. I'm curious what you're going to say about it, Tali. My feeling is that it, first of all, depends on the age of the children. If we're talking about teenagers, it might be a very different answer than a 30-year-old who's living with his girlfriend for five years already. It's a, it's a different situation. We can't compare them. There is something to be said that when a child is still living at home or, for example, a teenager, you might say, you know what? In our house, we don't sleep in the same room as our girlfriend. And that's one way of looking at it, the same way that in our house, we don't turn on the lights in Shabbat. Behind your closed door, I can't tell you what to do. I can't know what's going on. But in front of us, this is how we do things. That's very different when it's older. I'm sure that some people who are religious would worry about the problem of encouraging in their minds behavior which is contrary to the Torah, encouraging or allowing non-halachic behavior, maybe what they might call don't place a stumbling block before the blind, which means before somebody who doesn't realize they're doing something wrong, or for example, encouraging somebody or tempting somebody to violate a prohibition. I don't think that applies in this case at all. If a couple or a child comes home with a girlfriend and they want to sleep together in the same room, let's assume that they're older already. Let's assume they're in their 20s or 30s or whatever. You're telling them that you don't want them to sleep in the same room may or may not be your prerogative. That's a different question, but you're not encouraging the behavior because you allow it. I don't think they're going to say, oh, my parents are okay with this if they know you're not okay with it. Maybe as a parent, you are okay with it, but let's assume for the sake of this question, you're not. You're not going to be encouraging that behavior. In some ways, it might be like, you know, there are questions about inviting non-religious relatives over for Shabbat if you know they're going to drive. Are you allowed to invite them? And there are different answers. Different post say different things. So some would say, no, you can't. Others might say, well, as long as you give them the option to stay overnight by you or by a neighbor, even if they don't take you up on it, then you've fulfilled your responsibility. If they choose to drive, that's up to them. So obviously I'm speaking on a pure halachic level now because there's so much more to be said on an emotional level. I'm not trying to ignore that. I want to leave that for you, Tali. That's certainly your area of expertise more than mine. But it's a tough question. I think honesty is the most important thing. Open lines of communication, discussing what bothers you about it, discussing what you're okay with, being honest about it. What your policy is probably should be a policy which you determine together with the child in perhaps open dialogue where you can come to a reasonable way of dealing with this that you'll be less uncomfortable and the child will not feel that you're trying to impose upon them something which they're not interested in. Okay, so it's interesting because I think we skipped a question that had to do with being Shomer Nagia in public and private, and um, that kind of reminds Ooh, me. Oh, you're right. Okay, we'll come back to that one. But that's okay. No, because I thought about it because I think you had said that if you're not going to be Shomer Nagia, then be private about it. We had talked a little bit about that. What I'm thinking about this question, it's really interesting because, first of all, people make a lot of assumptions about children who are not as religious as their parents, if you want to call them on the datlash Avar spectrum or the OTD spectrum. Right. Um, Religious past and, tense. And the, yeah. And the thing is, is that I've had a lot of experience working with young adults who are on that spectrum. And there are many assumptions that are made about their sexuality and their sex lives. They came from the same place that their siblings are coming from. So they don't often know how to even navigate out there sexually. And uh, many of them are not having sex because they wouldn't even know where to, they don't know how, or they don't have basic information about it. So first of all, don't even assume anything about, about that. I very much appreciate what you said about open and honest communication. I've heard from women who are not religious or not that religious and went to Kala classes and the Kala teacher said, well, I don't have to teach you anything about sex. You already know. And they didn't know. They really didn't know. So being not religious doesn't equal being sexually active. Hello. And by the way, 
being religious doesn't equal not being sexually active because as the question that we accidentally skipped, which was regarding Shmirat Nagir pre-marriage, especially in serious relationships, how do you suggest discussions be handled about it? Should people keep a facade? And, you know, I think that it's the same kind of thing in a sense that, you know, who you are sexually is part of who you are. So back to the question about how to talk about it. I think that it's difficult to talk about it if it's difficult to talk about, whether you're religious or not religious. And I think sometimes the young adulthood is kind of late to be addressing who's going to sleep where. By the way, if you have a daughter and she's not so religious and she's in her late teens and she needs birth control if she's going to be sexually active, you're going to want to be able to be her mom for this. You know, you're going to want to be able to say, look, if you are going to be doing these things, you need to be doing it safely. You're allowed to teach your children your values and you're allowed to want, everybody wants their children to have the same values, but that doesn't always happen. But what you also want to be able to do is ask your children, ask them, ask them to articulate what their values are, what their values are around religion, what they are around sex. Stay very curious about what they want and what they believe in. Don't look necessarily at your children's not being religious anymore as a rebellion against you. It often has nothing to do with you. It's just their path. And by trying to stay non-judgmental, and I'm not trying to downplay the actual real pain that parents feel when their kids are, don't stay on the same derech that they're on. But I think that by not personalizing it, it makes it easier. A rebellion against a parent is not the same thing as a child becoming not religious when the parents are religious. It might be, but it's not inherently true. And it could very well be that a child is sexually active, and even though they may have different values in the sexual realm than their parents, they still might look to their parents as sexual models for themselves. In fact, they almost certainly do, for better or for worse. To me, the essential point is that a parent must be there for the child. A parent's job is to be there for the child, and by taking it personally and deciding, therefore, not to be available, you're not helping matters, and it's an abdication of responsibility, in my opinion. Yeah, no, I think that it relates to the same thing in a way, but you know, I, I don't think we actually answer the question, do you let them? Do you let them have their own room or not? Um, and I think that you were spot on with, you know, it's really very individual. If it's your youngest kid, let's say, and there are no other little kids at home, and you know that they're living together anyway, you might be able to say, look, I'm not going to interfere in the way that you wanted. It would it be if it's weird to sleep in different rooms, then you can sleep in the same room. You're doing it anyway. But if you have younger children and, you know, you would have a hard time kind of explaining it to them, I think it would be legitimate to say, look, we respect how you live your life, but we ask you when you come for Shabbat to respect how we live ours, just like you would not You would ask them not to do prohibited things on Shabbat in front of everybody, then you'll also ask them to do this for you. I think it's really a matter of mutual respect. Yeah, I think we're definitely on the same page here. Let's get back to that question, which we missed before. So that question was about how to talk about Shmirat Nigiyah, not touching before marriage, should people keep up a facade of being Shomer in public, but in private they aren't? How should people talk about it in a way that the privacy is kept while also having real, honest, quality conversations? It's a tough question. I don't think there's a right answer. The issues of public versus private, the idea of doing something, what's called in halacha, the farhesia, openly, I think it's a Greek word actually, versus the feeling that I'm a hypocrite if I pretend that I'm something that I'm not, it's, it's a good question and there aren't easy answers to that. There certainly is an idea that doing something in public is more serious than doing it in private, meaning if a person is mechalel Shabbat b'farhesia, publicly desecrating Shabbat, that is a different level of rejecting halachic Judaism than, for example, in public not desecrating Shabbat, but in private doing whatever you do, because in one case you're sort of putting yourself out there and it looks at least on some level like being a rebel, trying to advertise you're not keeping halachic norms. So I don't know exactly what's being asked in this particular question, even though I recognize it's a very strong and important question. I do think it's fair to say that someone should not feel hypocritical because in private they are doing X, but in public they don't do X. I don't think that's a wrong thing. And in fact, I'd go even further. I have spoken to people in the past. I was once talked to someone who was a young teacher. He was a young teacher in a Jewish school teaching Lumide Kodesh, 
Torah subjects. And on his Facebook page, he had a picture of him very clearly not being Shomer Nagia. And this is someone I was close to, and I felt comfortable saying to him in our conversation that I don't think that's a good idea because you're teaching one thing. You're then showing by your example something different. And I know you don't want to be a hypocrite. This person was very honest. But it's okay to teach one thing, and whatever you do in private is your own business, but you're sending mixed messages, and I think that might be a bigger problem in some ways. Now, lest somebody misunderstand what I'm saying, I do not mean that it's okay to do whatever you want in private as long as you don't advertise it in public. Obviously, halacha doesn't accept that. Halacha does demand certain behaviors, whether it's private or public. But what I mean is that if a person chooses, for his or her own reason, not to follow something in private, that does not mean, in my opinion, that therefore they must also publicly demonstrate that they're not following that. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, so I want to take some issue with your comments. I don't know that I agree with the idea of um, not keeping Shabbat in public as being similar to this. I don't, I don't think it's similar. I think it's very different. I think the difference is, is that when you are Mechalel Shabbat before Hesia, which means you're not keeping Shabbat in a public place, it doesn't afford you the status of calling yourself an observant Jew. Somebody who's not keeping Shabbat publicly is basically not, no longer identifying as an observant Jew. And I don't think that that's the same thing with choosing to touch your partner before you're married. I think that you can touch your partner before you're married and still hold on to your identity as a religious and observant Jew. It really is about time that we acknowledge that not everybody is Shomer Nagia. You know, before, one of the questions was, you know, how do I handle the two weeks that my wife is Anita, and I was thinking to myself, that's a question of privilege for all of these single people who don't have a relationship and don't get to touch anybody anytime. I think that we have to realize that today, it's very, very difficult to be in your mid to late 20s or 30s and to stay Shomer Nagia. And people aren't, they're not. You know, there are many, many people who are very religious and very committed and very spiritual, but they don't keep these particular, I don't know what to call them. I mean, because again, like we could talk about the sources, we've done that already. We know that the prohibition is sex mm -hmm. and the Shmirat Nagiya is so that it doesn't get to sex. Many Rishonim do hold that, but others, such as the Rambam, don't agree. And they would say that touching somebody who's in the status of Nida is itself a Torah prohibition. Okay. All right. In any event, I think that the question of whether you should display your affection in public is really a more general question of what are the situations in which it's appropriate to display your affection in public, even if you're married. Right. You know, there are places where it wouldn't feel appropriate. You know, if you're at the Kiddush after shul or something, that might not be exactly the place. But if you're strolling down the beach in Tel Aviv and you're not Shomer and you hold hands, then hold hands. I mean, I think that we want more than anything else, we want to be able to live a life with integrity. And we don't want to feel like we're splitting into different parts in different times for different places. Now, there are some people that would say, listen, if you're going to do an Avera, then, you know, if you're going to do something terrible or you're going to do something wrong, then, you know, don't flaunt it. I mean, there are going to be people that are hearing me now that are not, that are going to have a hard time with what I'm saying. And that's why I think that this answer is not for everybody. I think that it really a lot depends on your cultural milieu and where you live and what your community is like. But I do think that the important take home from this question is that we do want to try to eradicate some of the shame around this and some of the taboo around this and be able to also have forums where women and men can talk about this more openly. There definitely is a change towards making this discussion more out in the open because it is happening. People are not, Shomer and people are having premarital sex as well. And there has to be some way of talking about it. You know, while you have a position on it, you still need to be able to talk about it. It's definitely true. I don't think there are easy answers of how to talk about it. I'm sure there are many teachers who are listening who are saying, yeah, that sounds great in theory. How am I supposed to actually implement that and have these discussions without it sounding like I'm allowing something or condoning something, which I think is prohibited? It's a tough call. It's not easy. And I don't have the answer to that. But certainly not having a discussion isn't the right answer either. That much is clear. 
Unfortunately, Tali, we have so many questions to ask and answer, but we only got to a certain number of them. We will continue this conversation on Patreon. We'll get to the questions. We'll do another one, but it'll be for Patreon listeners. Exactly. Okay, so make sure you join on Patreon. You can find the link in the description of this podcast. Please remember what I mentioned earlier this coming Wednesday, February 17th at 8 p.m. Israel time, 1 p.m. Eastern time. And we'll be having a how to make your own podcast. It's free. Just send me an email to scott at jewishcoffeehouse.com and I will send you the Zoom link. Also, stay tuned for some of our upcoming episodes. We're going to be talking about sex toys, and we're also going to be talking eventually about kink. Also, we have that episode we need to do very soon on sexual pain disorders. Also, go to jewishcoffeehouse.com, go to tallyrosenbaum.com, and of course, go to intimatejudaism.com for show notes, a free men's mikvah list, and all of our podcast episodes. Thanks for listening. Thanks. Bye. Bye.